been peaks and valleys throughout uh, that, uh, those various uh, eras within our history, what you see over time is a long-standing trend towards immigration. And that's part of the value of, of, of Canada, that we, we look abroad and we see the best and the brightest. We see those who are talented and we say to them, yes, you are welcome to come to Canada. You are welcome to come, add, contribute, uh, and in a way that, that, that enhances who we are as, as a country. Hello friends, welcome back to my channel. My name is Wolo. I live in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and I love to talk about life in Canada and immigrating to Canada. At the beginning of this video, you must have heard the um, Minister of Immigration's voice um, talking about um, immigration. And that is because I attended a webinar organized by the Canadian Bar Association Immigration Law Section. And um, it was a question and answer session. And I will play the remaining part of the recording um, for the session. Although towards the end, um, I had technical issues and I could not continue the recording. So it is what I was able to record that I am actually going to play for you in the next few seconds. Um, basically, the immigration minister was answering some questions on IRCC processing time, the parents and grandparents um, application, temporary foreign workers, um, the CBSA, um, allowing people with um, visas to enter Canada and determining people who are supposed to be quarantined and all that, or people who are supposed to return if they are not essential workers um, so you'll be hearing um, the immigration minister answering those questions and um, like i said i couldn't record all of them because of the technical issue i had um, so hopefully you will be able to pick out one or two things out of the conversation and um, yeah so i'll be playing the recording now but what has been the impact uh, of COVID-19 on the department in terms of the operations, uh, both here and abroad? Well, the most obvious impact is that uh, our staff are not able to work uh, from their usual office space. And because of the way that our processes have been set up conventionally, um, that does pose some uh, immediate challenges around how it is that we process applications, how we move individuals who are coming in as permanent residents through the various stages until they are fully landed here. But what we have done is we have uh, looked at ways to uh, mitigate those challenges by setting up uh, remotely. And uh, here that involves uh, you know, ensuring that our people have access to the technologies that are required, whether it's through access to uh, work laptops or access to digital broadband, um, ensuring that uh, we are able to upload those devices with all of the tools that they would otherwise have access to in the office space. I think we're also looking at, uh, you know, our policies and, and seeing whether or not there are ways in which we can adapt them to create the flexibility given the exigencies of the circumstances that we now find ourselves in. And so together, when we uh, put all of this together, uh, what we're seeing is, is a real capacity to innovate, to evolve the way in which we are, are doing our business. And in some areas, we're actually making improvements. So for instance, uh, when it comes to the temporary foreign worker class, and the seasonal agricultural workers that we need very quickly, we have managed to speed up our processing of those visas so that those folks are able to get into Canada safely and securely as quickly as possible because you know we're 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 right on the on the at the beginning of, of planting season. I know we'll all have more to say about that in the uh, agri uh, part of our discussion, but really there, there has been a lot of evolution uh, around our processes. And I think that that will not only serve us during COVID-19 very well, but in fact, it will inspire new ways for us to do business in the long run. Okay, and we'll come to the agricultural workers. That's a question I want to ask you about. Um, another one that's uh, always on people's minds, and I have to say in every federal election, this is always the big issue that comes up, which is parents and grandparents. And you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue that we get inquiries about constantly. So 
you know, I, I wouldn't fall off my chair if you told me that there may be some delay with respect to this program. And of course, there's already been an announced delay. Um, but can you tell me, you know, what what are your thoughts on reopening it? Um, are we really waiting until a vaccine for this one? Like, what, what should we be telling people? Well, first, um, I don't want you to fall off your chair at all. Uh, and you look uh, firmly ensconced and very comfortable. So let's, let's hope you're still in that position at the end of this discussion. But when it comes to the parent and grandparent program, and more broadly, the work that our government has done uh, to reunite families, because bear in mind that the PGP is really just one way in which we are doing that. There's no government that has done more. There is uh, no government in the context of immigration that has reunited more families than ours. And I'm very proud of that work. And I am proud of the work that we have done and will continue to do under the parent and grandparent program. At the same time, as I think you uh, allude to in your question, uh, we are concerned that uh, parents and grandparents are among the, those who are at greatest risk uh, for COVID-19. So this, this is just part of the broader context that we have had to bear in mind as we uh, are constantly reassessing the way in which we are putting these programs to the ground and implementing them. Um, I will say that though it is important on, on the issue of family reunification, before I come specifically to your question about PGP, that mm -hmm. those individuals who are here and want to sponsor a spouse or a child who have lost their job because of COVID-19 and need to claim the Canada Emergency Response Benefit will not be penalized any way from doing so when it comes to the income qualifications. And I think that was a really important assurance. And again, uh, the one of, the, one of the, the vital pieces of feedback that we got from the CBA and from others in this sector. So if you have to claim serve and you are trying to sponsor somebody uh, to reunite your family, uh, there will be no disqualification as a result. You will not be ineligible because of that. And that's really key. That's not social when assistance. It's, that's right. It will, it will not be deemed social assistance for the purpose of, of your application and sponsorship. Um, when it comes to the PGP, look, I, I am really, re what resonates with me is that parents and grandparents who want to come and be here with their family, uh, but who are unable to uh, do so as quickly as they otherwise would have been were it not for COVID-19 are, are concerned about that. And I think it's important that we extend some compassion to the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And this is really a program that is born not only out of only uh, a compassionate desire to reunite families, but because there are some benefits that are brought to the household through the program. Um, what I hope to do uh, is to be able to have an update about when we intend to relaunch. And yes, it's true that COVID-19 has uh, been a disruptive force in those intentions, but uh, I, I feel as though we will remain committed to family reunification vis-a-vis -vis the uh, parents and grandparents program in the long run. And I'll have more to say about that in, in the not too distant future. Very good. Okay, well, let's now let's go back. Uh, you mentioned the agricultural program, so let's talk about that. Uh, of course, there have been some big shortages reported. Uh, Canadians are obviously understandably concerned about safeguarding our food supply. We saw we heard of cases where people were hoarding at the grocery stores and that kind of stuff. People were worried. So what has uh, your department done with respect to, you know, speeding up the process of foreign workers that are so critical? Because, you know, frankly, my understanding from talking to different people in the sector is that, you know, while it would be great if some of the unemployed Canadians could do it, um, some of this stuff is critical. And, uh, and you know, so what have you, what should it doing to, to speed up the processing of foreign nationals coming in? Well, I'm going to come to that in a moment, but first let me just say that hoarding doesn't help anyone, and I know that's not you and certainly not uh, the members that are on the line today, but th that, that, that uh, knee-jerk reaction is born out of fear, and I think one way in which we can address that is by educating the broader public about the steps that we are taking to safeguard food security, and the Immigration, Refugee, and Citizenship Department is playing a critical role in, on that front, and, and how are we doing that? Well, 
through the administration of the Temporary Foreign Worker Program. In the earliest uh, days uh, after the outbreak and the anticipated surge in Canada, uh, we made sure to uh, ensconce as part of the overall travel restrictions regime and exemption for uh, this class of workers. And we have prioritized the administration of seasonal agricultural uh, workers who are coming into Canada uh, by, as I say, putting the resources that are necessary, standing up special teams to process and turn around those applications as quickly as possible. We are working very closely with our provincial partners. And let me just give a nod to my provincial counterparts in particular who have been um, wonderful to work with on this file. Uh, everybody understands that uh, we need to uh, collaborate as much as possible when it comes to the administration of the TFW program because it really does involve overlapping jurisdictions. I also want to say that we have stayed close in touch with the agricultural sector and seafood sector employers who have a vested interest in seeing this program continue and we've provided some additional financial relief to them so that they can accommodate the physical spacing uh, and distancing that is required when it comes to lodging. Uh, and, and I want to uh, take a moment to acknowledge the advocacy of my colleagues, uh, Ministers Bibo and Qualtro and Jordan, with whom I, I share the responsibility for making this file work. Um, is there more that we can do? Uh, absolutely. And we are, we are always uh, looking at ways to create some additional uh, flexibility around work permits, around uh, really removing any barriers that might exist abroad. And that, that's just one thing that I want to highlight, that there are things that are within our control that we can try to mitigate. And then there are things that are beyond our control. And often, one of the greatest challenges at, at getting temporary foreign workers into Canada uh, are the set of circumstances that are uh, within the purview and the remit of, of, of countries, the source countries from which they're coming. So we do engage with our counterparts abroad. We are making progress. The other thing that is really beyond our control are the market uh, demands. And certainly in some sectors of the agricultural and seafood sectors, we will see for at least some period of time a, redu a reduced demand for certain types of, of foods and products. So that too has to be taken into to the mix. But I, I just want to assure you that on the whole, we have made tremendous progress, in particular in April, which is a key month in the uh, agricultural calendar, when we need to get those workers here. And of course, once they do get here, they do have to subject themselves to the 14-day mandatory isolation period, and then they can get out into work. And while there have been some outbreaks uh, recently, which I'm concerned about, and members of our government are very concerned about, we are working closely with the provinces to contain those outbreaks and make sure that uh, our regula re regulations uh, are really uh, working the way they are intended to, so around inspections, around compliance, so that we can safeguard uh, the, the, the health and safety of those workers, Canadians, and overall our food supply chain. And overall, I mean, I think it's been, yes, I know the outbreak you're talking about, but it's been fairly impressive in, in terms of planes and you know we need to think about 60,000 agricultural workers and we've had um, very close to that number coming in um, so I think that's been uh, very good in terms of uh, being able to take part of the food supply. So now let me turn to something that's a bit more legalistic. Uh, you know normally, we talked about CBSA before, normally the Canada Border Services Agency relies on immigration guidance uh, because normally the Canada Border Services Agency is interpreting the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. And so it makes sense to rely on the Immigration Department for guidance with respect to that. But now we have the CBSA, which is interpreting orders in council uh, pursuant to the Quarantine Act. So we now have CBSA interpreting things that aren't immigration laws per se. Uh, yet, IRCC, the Immigration Department, is continuing to publish guidance with respect to what is optional, what's discretionary. So I guess the question is, you know, and in my mind, I think that there should be, there's a role for CBSA to have guidance because they need to have guidance with respect to people showing up to the border. And there's a role for guidance from the Immigration Department because, of course, that may relate to visa offices abroad, et cetera. But what is your expectation around CBSA following the guidance that the department is continuing to publish? Because the guidance from the Immigration Department very much reflects 
the letter of the law with respect to the Oregon Council, which is about you know reuniting families, foreign nationals being able to come. So, do you expect CBSA to follow IRCC guidance, or do you accept that they should be able to follow their own guidance? Well, first, I want to uh, extend uh, my uh, appreciation to our, our frontline CBSA workers because they have the unenviable task of having to apply these uh, th this totally new uh, travel restrictions regime, which was uh, created in a very short period of time, uh, without the benefit of having you know the usual uh, luxury of reflection and implementation, and so. There, 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 there has to be some space in our overall assessment of how this is all working on the ground level for the very difficult and exigent circumstances in which uh, we are now operating in this COVID era. Uh, and of course, we do uh, work closely with CBSA to ensure that they understand how the law was designed, in particular around the orders in council that are, are, are governing the, the, the back and forth over uh, our international borders. And we have tried to take a very sensible approach to this, which is to say we've created some uh, exemptions for immediate family members, family reunification, international students, temporary workers, uh, those who are visa holders who are seeking to become permanent residents and other officials who need to come into the, the country for national security reasons or public interest reasons like related to public health care and, and responding to COVID-19. So there is a lot in this mix is my point and we uh, do recognize that there are sometimes issues that come up at the border uh, by the way those challenges existed before COVID-19 and I think we can all acknowledge that they will probably exist mm -hmm. after we're uh, the other side of this curve so how we are working through these issues is both at the policy level uh, as well as uh, on a on a day-to-day -day basis by troubleshooting uh, those problems when they're brought to my office's attention or they're brought to the attention of my colleague, Minister Blair. Uh, we do try to, uh, again, exercise some uh, good judgment uh, when, when the discretion is exercised at the, at the border. And we know that sometimes, uh, you know, that that creates uh, an impediment for, for those who are trying to reunite their family. But the, the principle that guides all of this and the message that we have tried to send to everybody who is uh, wanting to come to Canada or who is Canadian and wants to travel abroad is, if you don't need to travel, then don't. If it's essential, if it's related to your work, if there are really, really urgent circumstances that require you to, uh, to go abroad and come back, then, then do so. And when you know, that, that principle seems uh, a bit uh, weak at the border, we also expect that our CBSA uh, officials will will exercise the judgment uh, in the circumstances, which may mean uh, turning them back. That's not because they're trying to be difficult. It's because they are trying to uphold uh, the most important priority in this in this present context, which is to protect the health and safety of, of Canadians. And it has. I mean, absolutely, it's been it's been very difficult for again people are working from home, uh, and policies have to be developed. And it's been um, a whirlwind for us as the private bar, but it's been, I'm sure it's been quite difficult on officials to, to create policies um, and, and to respond on a sort of evolving basis uh, to, um, to the crisis. So uh, we do appreciate that these are not, are not normal times to develop. One thing that we've suggested is that, you know, there is, um, is, is sort of give us a, as many examples as possible. Uh, so that then we can communicate uh, to our clients and tell them, you know, this is maybe not the right time to come. Uh, but uh, that's something that I am i can tell you I'm working very closely with uh, uh, Minister Blair's office as well and trying to get the two departments to 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 speak in one voice as much as possible. And, and I think that, uh, again, the departmental officials have been phenomenal in terms of uh, acceptance to our comments and our... For um, sure. And sometimes criticism about about trying to be you know just having more examples so people will know uh types of scenarios better but on that note i mean there's um you know let's talk about work permits so you know the deputy prime minister um said that um foreign nationals may and foreign workers may enter canada uh and you know that sort of made sense to us because there was obviously a, a twin concern one is of course the health and safety of canadians the other is our economy 
And so it did make sense to us that, you know, the Canadian government wanted to keep foreign workers entering Canada uh, to help with our economy and sustaining it. Uh, you know, then there were a few carve-outs which made sense to me, like, for instance, the working holiday program, which is, to me, akin more towards, you know, tourism in the sense that you're coming here, you may be getting a job in a bar or whatever, and having some life experience. So the idea that that program would, would um, you know, would, people wouldn't be welcome so much in that program made sense to me. Uh, the idea that if you had a work permit, but frankly, your job wasn't available anymore, well, that's, an, that's a sensible carve-out because it doesn't make sense to have you fly to Canada for a job that no longer exists. So that made sense. Um, but I guess in the, in the bar where a lot of concerns were raised around, is there what I call a test upon a test? So in other words, um, there's basic work permit criteria. There's all kinds of work permit, pro, uh, you know, work programs relating to work permits. Uh, but is there a test relating to things like, um, you know, again, critical infrastructure, food supply, uh, coming to, 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 to fight COVID-19 with respect to research or as a doctor. Um, you know, if you're not in one of those three areas, uh, are you still welcome to come to Canada? Are we still open for business? Are we still allowing workers to come in? Or is, this, or is there a test sitting upon the test? I guess that's something I, I was hoping you might be able to comment on. Uh, happy to answer that. And, and just before we move on, I, I will take a moment to say I do appreciate that you're working closely with uh, my office and others who are attending this webinar today uh, when it comes to working through some of those individual cases at the border which are problematic. And mm -hmm. I just want to underline we are trying to be uh, compassionate and trying to be responsive to those cases because they are difficult. And we do uh, work through them uh, wherever we possibly can in conjunction with the CBSA. And Thank you so much for listening and see you in my next video. Bye-bye.